I'm going to start with a, a story from my own background that uh, took place in 1995. My closest faculty friend at the first college I served in such a role that I do here now was Larry Brightboard, he's a professor and chair of anthropology. And he had, after 20 years or so, secured an opportunity to become the chief academic officer at a college a little south of where we were in Wisconsin, uh, Knox College in Galesburg, Illinois. Larry had been invited in 1995, prior to his departure, to deliver what was perhaps a precursor to TEDx talks. This was common on college and university campuses, and it was called the Last Lecture Series. And the premise was an esteemed faculty member or staff member from a college was invited by the community to deliver a lecture under the premise that it would be the last one that they would ever deliver. So in Larry Brightboard's case, it was indeed his last lecture at Beloit College. And what he spoke of was to his students mainly that he had, that he was still changing, that he was still growing. Um, that he wasn't done yet, he wasn't finished yet, that he was a work in progress. And I've always remembered that, and so when I was invited to deliver a TEDx talk here, given what Dr. Kennedy mentioned, that I'm retiring in three months, almost exactly, and that I am 64 and 19 twentieths years old, um, so in about 18 days, I'll turn 65. And it made me reflect myself on what should I talk about? What do I have to offer? Well, you need to know that professionally, as was mentioned, I'm a career counselor. And I've been doing that for 35 years. And so I tried to narrow it down to one point that I could offer. And thank you for letting me be a little self-indulgent to describe a little bit of my personal story. And I just want to do a little more of that. So, 1995 was 22 years ago. And here I am, about to retire. It's pretty surreal. And you come to, to grips with that. And you kind of rock back and forth between I'm ready and I'm not done yet, at least with that word. So, I was on an airline a couple of years ago, and I had a seat in the back. And as I went to the back, I used my person observation skills. And by the time I got to, you know, 33A, I had noticed all the folks, and I said, you know, there aren't any old folks on this plane. And then I realized, I'm the old folks. And this was just a couple of years ago. So, there's that. I would contend that at age 64 and 1920th, I have felt like an adult maybe four or five times. And so I have to grapple with that as I look at uh, the next chapter of my experience. So, here's the topic I've chosen, and I'm, as Laurel mentioned, um, I've been curious about curiosity. And this is framed by the work I do with undergraduates as they try and imagine their next chapter or their next summer. And um, it comes to bear, and that'll, um, I'll shed some light on that in a little bit. But where it all begins is I started with some definitions. I looked up curiosity in any number of dictionaries and other sources. And I couldn't find the definition I had hoped to see. Every definition of curiosity, intellectual curiosity, historical curiosity, you, you name it, focused on being curious external of ourselves. And I was looking for a definition that looked at curiosity within, of what we have inside ourselves and how we use that and how we become curious 
about who we are and what we have and what our potential is. I then looked at other words. I looked up motivation. I looked up purpose. I looked up drive and a number of other terms. And I still didn't find that internal focus on curiosity. Now I reflected in my graduate studies and my counseling psychology cognate, and I remember Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Now I've, as you can probably tell, I have eliminated the descriptions with the first four levels of need, they're rather basic, so that we can focus on self-actualization. And descriptions there are more morality, creativity, spontaneity, problem solving, lack of prejudice, acceptance of facts, and there's more. And Maslow used another phrase, as I recalled, that went to exceptional moments of performance. So I thought about that. And I'm going to invoke, because it's March Madness, a sports, a series of sports metaphors. So imagine the distance runner in a marathon at mile 22 hits what is called the wall, pushes through it, finds a different level of oven within themselves, and makes it to the finish line. Think of the diver who shoots for that perfectly clean entry. The gymnast who sticks her landing. And because it's March, the hoops folks who dig within themselves, rise to the occasion, and find their way to the next level of performance. So it sounds pretty good so far. Well, it's not easy. You have to overcome fear, you have to start somewhere, and you have to take risks. So, um, I wanna talk now and kind of bring it to, to the end in terms of looking at our capacity, my capacity, your capacity. What if you applied those same concepts, because again, I'm a career counselor by training in nature and passion, what if you applied those same concepts of extreme peak performance in looking at your own capacity? And through my lens, what if you looked at your next chapters of that next internship, of that next job search, of applying to graduate or professional school, of seeking a fellowship, and went to that concept of looking within ourselves Aren't you curious to know what you have inside you of what your next level is? And it can be, it won't be something that's sustainable over time, like many other um, aspects and facets of life. It comes and goes. Happiness comes and goes is another example of fleeting and ebbing and flowing. But what if you push your capacity in terms of your next chapter in life? So here's where I want to conclude with this, <clears throat> and that is, I see so many of the students I've worked with over the years and decades going to a computer, looking at all the jobs or internships that are out there, and they have one of three reactions. For some they see, thank goodness they say, yuck. For others they see, occasionally, they'll say something like, well, that's cool. The one I always worry about is the third, and that is when you look at an opportunity and you say, I guess I could. That's the one that freaks me out a little bit. But what if you didn't take that approach of just looking online or doing things in addition to that, and that when you're applying for opportunities and you get to the point of the interview, so many people worry that the, interview, the interviewer has all the power. I would contend that that's not the case. My contention is you have the power, and that's what the interviewers are looking for and hoping to see and rarely find. Ask yourself, have you ever been accused of being arrogant? 
And I would say the vast majority of students at Dennis and their answer would be no. So what's the risk there? Push yourself. Take that risk. And instead of the driver being to figure out what the interviewers and employers and grad schools want to hear, instead, let your internal driver be, how can I make sure that they understand who the hell I am and what I bring to the table and what I have to offer? It's through that internal power and internal strength that you can find your next level. Start now. Life is short, goes by in a blink. Don't wait, that self-actualization frame, that pinnacle of the pyramid, most of us look at that and say, well, that's way later in life. No, it's now, start now, power up. You're needed out there, okay? So with that, I just wanna close with a couple more personal reflections. Never let anybody subjugate your internal strength, your power, your verve, your charisma, your mojo, okay? And show them who you are. So I'm done because I have to go figure out what I'm gonna be when I grow up. <laughs> Thanks.